I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is California in the 2020 race. A contentious meeting in San Francisco of the Democratic National Committee. 13 presidential candidates in our state this weekend. Among them, Senator Cory Booker. The way you beat darkness is with light. The way you beat hate is with love. We speak with the New Jersey Senator about guns, the president, and Luke Skywalker himself, Mark Hamill, endorsing him after watching The Issue Is. Plus, Congresswoman Nanette Diaz-Barragan is here in studio to talk about immigration, gun control, and Dodger baseball. The issue is starts right now. And welcome to the issue is I'm Alex Michelson. This week, California once again at the center of the race for president. San Francisco is hosting the summer meeting for the Democratic National Committee. There was a bit of tension as activists pushed for a debate all about climate change. Party leaders said no to that. 13 presidential candidates making the trip to California to address those delegates, many of them hosting campaign stops across the state leading up to this weekend. On Wednesday, Senator Elizabeth Warren with a rally at the Shrine Auditorium near downtown L.A. On Thursday, Senator Bernie Sanders in Paradise, California, the town hardest hit by the campfire. Sanders unveiling a $16 billion plan to address climate change. Also on Thursday, Senator Cory Booker joined L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti in the Crenshaw neighborhood of Los Angeles for a forum about gun control. They did so at a business once supported by the late rapper Nipsey Hussle. On Wednesday, Booker in the Palms neighborhood of Los Angeles for a fundraiser. Afterwards, he took some questions from us. I began by asking about a proposal recently pushed by Beto O'Rourke, a mandatory national buyback of assault rifles. Senator, on, on, on the issue of gun control, yes. um, you know, what do you support in terms of specific things to do? Do you believe that there should be mandatory assault weapons buybacks in so this country? I hope everybody will go to CoreyBooker.com. Our proposal has been called the boldest uh, in this campaign. It supports things that are evidence-based. It includes banning assault rifles. It includes uh, licensing. If you need a license to drive a car, you should have a license to buy and possess a handgun. So please check it out. We have been leading on this issue because I'm... I'm the only guy in this race that has literally had people shot in their neighborhood recently, and I'm going to fight not only to get my plan in place, but we're going to bring a fight to the NRA and the corporate gun lobby like they've never seen before uh, and, and win this fight. I mean, what does that actually look like? How do you actually win the fight? Because the president now proposes something, the NRA goes back. I mean, if you have Republicans in the Senate, can you actually pass uh, gun control? Does it mean getting rid of the filibuster? Well, let me tell you, we are going to pass this legislation. Governments are formed. One of the principal reasons is for the defense of their people. We live in a nation now that has had more people killed in the last 50 years due to gun violence than in every single war we've had combined from the Revolutionary War till now. I will fight this fight. I'm not going to tell all the tactics we're going to use, but we're going to bring it and we're going to win because the majority of gun owners, the majority of Republicans, the majority of Americans agree with me. And the guy puts his arm around me and he goes, Dude, I want you to punch Donald Trump in the face. And I look at him, I go, dude, that's a felony, man. The bottom line of what you're talking about is essentially a completely different approach to governing than what President Trump is talking about, a completely different approach to politics. Some Democrats, though, are afraid that they may, that may not be tough enough for President Trump when he's a bully and he's levying all this sort of things against that, and they want somebody who is a fighter, who is going to push, punch President Trump in the face. What do you say to those people? Well, first of all, anybody who knows me, how I emerged and beat a machine in Newark, there's literally a movie called Street Fight. <laughs> so I, I, an Oscar-dominated movie about, a documentary about my emergency into politics. So nobody has had the kind of fights that I've had and won them. I've gone up against bullies before and beat them. I've gone up against demagogues before and beat them. We can win, but we don't win it by sacrificing your values. Donald Trump wants us to fight him on his turf, on his terms, in the gutter. That's not how we win. The way we beat bullies and demagogues in the past is by energizing and exciting the moral imagination of the country as a whole. The challenge now is not just uh, uh, the mean darkness and hate words of the some, it's the too much silence of the many. And, and I'm going to be the kind of candidate that ignites more people, energizes more people. That this isn't just an election to get rid of one guy, it's going to be a movement election that inspires this whole country to come together, not just to get a new president, but to really solve the problems of injustice in our country. I know you saw that during the last debate, uh, our focus group said, everybody on it said that you were the winner. 
The name of the person you thought won the debate tonight. Cory Booker. 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 Cory Booker. 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 Good, and you tweeted that out. Um, but there hasn't been a giant jump in the polls for you because of that. And just in terms of strategy, where do you go from here? Well, first of all, most Americans know this. We're six months out from Iowa. No one, and I mean no one, since before I was born, pretty much, has ever gone on to win the presidency from our party who was leading in the polls at this point. The polls have meant nothing this far out. What actually does mean something, though, is what you'll hear from people in Iowa. Who has the best organization on the ground? Who's building the best team? In fact, we lead in Iowa endorsements, Iowa state legislators, people who want to be on the winning team in Iowa. We, we have more endorsements in Iowa than the top five polling candidates combined. We are going to win in Iowa in the same way that Barack Obama was behind, came back, won in Iowa. John Kerry, polling at 4%, came back and became our nominee. So we know how to win elections. Fun, one fun question. Last time I was with you, we do something on our show called Personal Issues, where we have a little bit of fun. Uh, favorite Star Wars character? I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I love the Jedi Knights, man. So I'm going to say uh, definitely Luke Skywalker. Mark Hamill uh, saw, he tweeted out that the Force is with you. Yes. What did that mean to you? Um, as a, I'm a sci-fi buff and uh, uh, for people like Mark Hamill, uh, Leonard Nimoy's uh, incredible, incredible widow, she's amazing, uh, is endorsing me. These are wonderful things, but at the end of the day, um, this is about uh, Americans, this is about the dignity of work, it's about access to health care, it's about making sure this country works for everybody, and it's nice that the movement of my campaign is growing, and I'm so excited about the road ahead. Our thanks to Senator Cory Booker and to Mark Hamill for watching. All right, it's that time of the week when we say bye-bye-bye to the latest candidates to leave the presidential race with a little help from our friends in NSYNC. We begin with Seth Moulton. He's out. Chances are you didn't know he was in. Uh, he is the 40-year-old Iraq War combat veteran. He never qualified for any of the presidential debates. He ended up his campaign at the DNC meetings in San Francisco, urging the party to pursue a centrist path. Moulton says he will run for re-election for his seat in the House, which is in a district near Boston. Washington Governor Jay Inslee also out. He focused his campaign on the issue of climate change, but he never caught on with voters. It's not clear if he'll run for a third term as Washington governor or try and be Secretary of Energy for a possible Democratic president. Former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper is saying bye bye bye. His most memorable moments being booed for defending capitalism at the California Democratic Convention and getting into a wild gesture contest with Bernie Sanders on the debate stage. Hickenlooper says that he will now run for the Senate seat in Colorado. Sticking with the in sync theme, there's plenty of candidates who still think that it's gonna be me when it comes to becoming the nominee. Here are the key dates to know. August 28th is the deadline to qualify for the next debate. Right now, 10 candidates have already qualified. If more than 10 qualify, Tulsi Gabbard, Tom Steyer, pretty close, then becomes a two-night affair. That would be September 12th and 13th on ABC. Up next, I'm sure she's an InSync fan, Congresswoman Annette Barragon is here. She's got a unique personal story when it comes to immigration. We'll talk about that, guns, and a whole lot more next. From Southern California to the Bay Area, you're watching The Issue Is. Welcome back and welcome for the first time to Democratic Congresswoman Nanette Diaz Barragan. Uh, for those of you that are meeting her for the first time, she was first elected to the House in 2016. Her district includes Carson, Compton, San Pedro, and Watts. She is the youngest of 11 kids. Her parents were immigrants from Mexico. She worked in the Clinton White House. She worked as the Hermosa Beach mayor before this. Welcome to The Issue Is. Thank you for having me. Good to Appreciate see you. It. All right, well, let's talk for a moment about the big issue right now, which is guns. I know you just got off the phone with some right. of the Democratic leadership on this issue. The big question everybody wants to know right now is, where do we go from here? Well, the first thing is House Democrats have passed the bipartisan background checks. We have to get Mitch McConnell to get a vote on that in the Senate. That's one of the first steps. But House Judiciary is actually taking up hearings on this issue, coming back early from the recess to do that. There's going to be hearings on the assault weapons bans and other possibilities for gun safety issues. It's a big, it's a big deal. It's a big issue. Constituents are calling us every day about so it. So why would Mitch McConnell actually do this? I mean, how, how do you change the political <laughs> dynamics? Because we've been in the right. same cycle over and over and over again for all of these years. Newtown didn't change it. Right. All these other shootings, San Bernardino didn't change it. Borderline didn't change it. Why is this going to change it? You know, it's very frustrating. The American people have been speaking out. They've been calling. We need the president to step up. 
and to give him the green light. The president said he was going to do it. It wasn't until the NRA picked up the phone, Alex, and had that conversation with the president that he's backtracking out. We've got to keep up the pressure, and we have to continue doing the work so that we can see the Senate act on this really critical issue. So issue. speaking on, of the president, here's what he had to say about guns. Oh, I have an appetite for background checks. We're going to be doing background checks, and I think we're going to have something, hopefully, that's meaningful. Do you believe him? No, because he's already, he's already backtracked from that statement that he made. And that's the concern that we have. That's the hard part of working with this president. He says something one day, the next day he changes his mind. But we got to hold him to it. Let's hold him to that promise. Another big issue, of course, is that of immigration, which you know uh, so well yourself. Uh, the, yeah. the detention centers are again in the news. This week there was mm -hmm. talk that they're, they're, they're pushing to potentially make it easier to keep kids there longer. Uh, yeah, in some of these detention centers. I know you've visited some of these mm -hmm. detention centers. How do you see that playing out? Sort of where do we go from here on that? Well, that effort, first of all, is in contradiction to what the law is now. The Flores decision says you're not supposed to hold kids for more than 20 days. The president basically wants to indefinitely jail children. It's an outrage, and it's against the law. Hopefully the courts are going to come in and stop it. Look, the last time I was there, I saw something and was shocked. There was an American citizen, a 13-year-old girl, born in New York, that was being held in one of these centers. That's unconscionable. We should not be holding American citizens. How do you do that legally, and, and, and what happened to her? Well, um, we were told that she had just recently uh, been apprehended with her mother, who came over who didn't have papers. Um, but she had a passport with her. When I was there in the center, her mother handed me the passport. We had to advocate to get her out. And she was out in five hours. But we shouldn't be having American citizens being held. And that's a picture of you with your parents right there. Oh. You've been uh, very open yeah. about the fact you're the youngest of 11 kids, that your yeah. parents uh, were undocumented. Um, how has that shaped your perspective coming to Congress, having this debate with a lot of people who had a very different life experience than you? Well, I saw the struggles that my parents went through when they got here. I saw how they went through, my mother in particular went through the citizenship process, how she studied very hard, how she really took it to heart, and how proud she is to be an American and to go out and to vote. And so I've seen that happening through my mom. My father, I didn't learn until after he died, I was very, I was young, that he actually never became a citizen. Um, so I've seen both sides when one of your parents goes through the process and one doesn't. It impacts the way I think and my decision-making process because of my experience in seeing the challenges that are faced by, by immigrants and, and the law. Yeah, one of the debates happening right now in the Democratic Party in the presidential race is over this question of whether we should decriminalize the border, mm -hmm. essentially making it not a felony or not making it a crime to cross over the border. What do you think about that? Should we decriminalize border crossing? Well, I think that it's a complicated issue. Look, there are a lot of things going on in immigration. One of the things that we really need to focus on right now is how do we fix what's going on in the southern border? And how do we invest in these countries in the northern triangle where people are coming and fleeing from the violence so they're not doing that anymore? So do you agree with Julian Castro and those other people calling for decriminalization? I think we need to look at that uh, more and talk more about it. There's certainly a good topic for debate. Okay, that sounds like something else that Kamala Harris has said before. <laughs> Let's have a conversation, which she says a lot of times when she doesn't want to answer something. Uh, she is your pick, uh, somebody that you have uh, endorsed early on, uh, yes. before even the debate started. That's right. Um, uh, why is that? And, and are you you're still behind her? Where do you see her in the race right now? Absolutely. It's very early. Look, I endorsed her before she announced. I work with her in the Senate um, on legislation. Uh, she's my senator. She's come to my district. We've done work together. I believe she's the right person right now and the progressive champion that we need. Well, one thing uh, that was cool we saw before the last debate, she came out onto the stage. She was wearing a Dodger hat. You know, some people say she's a Giants fan, but she's wearing a Dodger hat, something that you are very proud of. You're a fan, that you're a Dodger Absolutely. fan, right? So we're going to have a little bit of fun. We're going to talk some baseball because we're going to put her in, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a lot of experience playing baseball. We're going to talk about that, talk about how baseball has changed the Congresswoman's life in so many ways, how she's getting a lot of people involved in the community. We're going to play our personal issues game and our name game, which is usually the most entertaining part of the show. So stay with us for that if you're watching The Issue Is. Welcome back with an assist from Destiny's Child. It's time for the name game. This is your fi first time doing this, Congresswoman Annette Diaz-Bergon. So we, we pick one word, 
or a really short phrase, but hopefully one word <laughs> for some of the biggest names in politics. You ready for that? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Let's start it off with President Trump. Dishonest. Vice President Mike Pence. No women. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. Strong woman. Uh, Congresswoman Elon Omar. Historic woman. Former Vice President Joe Biden. Ooh, that's a tough one. Obama. Okay. Uh, Senator Kamala Harris. President. And Dodgers potential MVP, Cody Bellinger. Absolutely. Clayton Kershaw, historic. <laughs> what are you, uh, Dodgers, big thing for you, right? You grew up going to Dodger oh, yes. games. You're like obsessed with the Dodgers. You play for the congressional baseball game. You wear a Dodgers uniform proudly. You're the second baseman. Uh, what do the, the Dodgers sort of mean to you? So I actually didn't go to games growing up. My father was terminally ill, mm. and that's what he and I did together. Mm. We watched games together, and sometimes he would shake a lot, and I would just sit there and I would hold him. But we were always watching a Dodger game. So when I watch the Dodgers, when I go to a game, it's like spending time with my dad. So it's got a very personal meaning for me. Um, I'm a huge, huge Dodger fan. Going to go check out the game tonight against the Yankees. And so there, there, we see some pictures right now of you uh, wearing your Dodgers uniform playing. Uh, what, what's your play like? Oh, it's, it's amazing. Look, I have so much fun. It's bipartisan. You build relationships across the aisle. But every child dreams about playing on a Major League Baseball field. I had to run for Congress to make that dream come true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to play a game called Personal Issues. This is where we put 30 seconds up on the clock and uh, we get to know you a little bit better with some, some rapid-fire questions. You ready for this? Okay, okay, okay here we go. What's your favorite meal? Pizza. Favorite nickname? Nana. Dog or cat? Dog. Favorite kind of pie? Strawberry. Favorite book? Just Mercy. Favorite Disney movie? Coco. Uh, who's your role model? RBG. RBG. Favorite song? California Love. That is true. California Love. Before we, before we get to that, uh, you did mention uh, RBG, and I want to get your thoughts mm -hmm. in a moment. We get word that she is uh, being treated for pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. um, they say that no t more tests are needed. What are your thoughts on, on her? She is one of the strongest women that I have ever known and read about, and I have faith in her, and all our thoughts and prayers are with her that she's going to have a speedy recovery, critically important to have her on the court as we start the new term in October. I mean, has she been, she, you're a lawyer, has she been an inspiration to you? Oh, no doubt about it. You know, she opened doors um, and set the pathway for women lawyers and women across this country on everything from equality to, uh, you know, women having a seat at the table. And, of course, she has uh, been battling bowel cancer three different times over the course of a couple decades. Um, so hopefully this uh, ends as well as the last um, have as well. The um, she is certainly a force. All right, you said that your favorite song is California Love. A walk -up there it song is. It's, it's one of our favorite songs. Why is this your favorite song? So this is Kenley Jansen's walk-up song. I used it in Congress for baseball as well, and it's a shout-out to my district. Awesome. All right. California. So, oh, you sing it too. Just had a party. I was giving. I was giving it to you. All right. Well, up <laughs> next, we have a final word about another great musician, the uh, Rolling Stones. But as we go to break. One more chance for the Congresswoman to rock out to Tupac. <laughs> In the city. What city? Rolling Stones with their first concert at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena in 25 years. Their first show in California, by the way, was 55 years ago. The greatest band in the history of rock and roll, still going strong, still selling out stadiums. I had the pleasure of attending this week with my mom and my sister. Got the tongue ready to go. Our managing editor, Pete Wilgorn, was also there with his two beautiful daughters. The show literally ended with fireworks. Next week, We'll have some fireworks of a different sort. An issue is debate between the Young Turks, Hassan Piker, and Fox News Channel's Gianno Caldwell. Both of them have been in the news a lot recently. 
Reminder that all of our past shows, including podcasts with them, available in podcast form. There's an archive of digital-only sit-downs with our panelists. Search for The Issue Is wherever you stream, and please leave us a review and tell your friends. We end with the master of all front men, Mick Jagger. I was trying to study his moves a little bit. He does a lot of this, a lot of this, you know, and then there's a little bit of this. No one moves like Jagger, right? Thanks for watching. We'll leave it to him. Take it away, Mick.